Hey, uh, let's get this thing kicked off. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining our collaboratory. Uh, this discussion is going to be about um, the coronavirus and how it's impacting companies uh, across the world. And we're very lucky today to have uh, some speakers from Latin America and Europe who will give us their views and I'll be providing some ideas about, about North America as well and, those, and the globe as well. Um, uh, I am the Executive Director and Chief Research Officer for the Digital Supply Chain Institute. My name is George Bailey, as I said, and um, we really are excited to have this discussion. And I want to be very clear up front that this, not a, this is not a discussion of the overall impact of the coronavirus on the world. It's a discussion about how it impacts business, especially the supply chain. And as you know, the supply chain is the key uh, process for most companies. And it certainly is highly impacted by what's happening in the world today with this, this pandemic. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Digital Supply Chain Institute, and I think almost everybody on this call does, but for those of you who don't know, we are a not-for-profit. Uh, we're headquartered in New York City, but we have global reach. Uh, we have a set of uh, co-directors that manage us, who give us guidance and vision. And that includes uh, Sam Pomizano, who is a very active board member and was the chairman and CEO of IBM, a very successful chairman and CEO of IBM uh, for a long time, really record setting. Uh, we have uh, Mike Crow, who's the CIO for Colgate Palmolive, fabulous company. We have Andre Soldo, who's the head of operations strategy for Dell, and uh, Colin Brown, who's the uh, head of Under Armour's supply chain business and chief operating officer. So we have some great co-chairs, we're a membership-driven organization, uh, and we seek to tell the absolute truth about what's happening in the world of supply chain, and most importantly, where things are going. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. So here's the objectives for today's session. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure we can outline the overall impact of this coronavirus, COVID-19, on supply chains, especially how these supply chains are going to survive. Uh, for many companies, uh, there's a real difficult issues to make out around cost and revenue and demand and future actions. So we'll talk a little bit about that today and make sure that that discussion gets heard. Uh, we'll also talk very importantly about demand. And uh, as you may know, uh, we really believe that demand is probably the most important thing to uh, work on in this time of, of problem. It's also uh, probably the most important thing a supply chain can work on, uh, in addition to, of course, sales and marketing and other groups. Are but this whole idea of front side flip, where the supply chain faces the front, faces the customer, faces the market, is something that's uh, really, really critical, especially now. So that's first thing is outline that. Second is to describe what companies are doing. And you're going to have some great examples today, and I'll describe who those speakers are in a minute or two, but real examples of what companies are doing and how they're uh, deploying their solutions in this uncertain world in front of us. And finally, as we go through this discussion, we should develop recommendations that help your supply chain. Uh, how does it win with your customers? How does it win with your shareholders? How can you make uh, this situation work uh, as best possible for, for those constituencies? And I want to make it clear that it's really important that uh, you participate in this. So um, most of you can just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And when you do that, uh, you'll be able to put in questions uh, that our panelists will answer. So I'll make sure that uh, we'll either answer those questions today on the call or afterwards I'll, I'll send you an email with the answers that, you, that you're looking for. So really, really super important that we uh, participate. I may call on some of you. You can raise your hand if you have some question you wanna ask verbally. There's a way to uh, click on the chat screen uh, and uh, you'll be able to raise your hand and ask a question and we'll. We'll go ahead and call on you. So use the Q&A button as your first uh, option. If you have something that verbally makes more sense to do, then uh, raise your hand and we'll try to call on you and get the discussion going. We've really uh, programmed this so that uh, at least half the time is on Q&A. So your participation uh, is important. It's the best way for you to get value from this. And uh, uh, we've had a, a couple of really successful sessions for this one. We plan to do several others. Our next one, by the way, is going to be May 7th. And we'll have a different set of speakers, a different set of companies there to talk. Uh, but it will also be about what companies are doing to be successful and push ahead in the coronavirus era. So 
So next slide, please. Those are our objectives. Here's our agenda. Now I want to start out by saying we had originally uh, planned to have Mike Crow from Colgate Palmolive uh, speak to us today. He contacted me uh, just a little while ago and they had some meetings come up that will prevent him from, uh, from joining the call. So I, I apologize for Colgate Palmolive not being on the agenda right now. We'll have them in a future session. Uh, they're a great company with a lot of actions going on. And as you probably know, uh, right now everybody's calendar is a little bit uh, difficult to manage because things are, are going on in such, such a rapid pace. But here's what our agenda is right now. Uh, I'm gonna give you some observations and some recommendations based on what we see around the world, and particularly in North America. Uh, I'm gonna turn that over to uh, Diego de la Maza, who's uh, the Director of Supply Chain uh, and Planning for Arauco. Uh, probably every single person on this call has experience with Arauco products. They are one of the world's top, top uh, forest products companies. And uh, their brand is not well known, but believe me, you've been in places where their materials, their wood products are a part of the building. So you may not know who they are, but you actually know what their products are. So uh, they've got a great story. They have a global supply chain. Diego can tell us a lot about how that works and we'll, we'll, hear, uh, we'll hear, hear more in just a minute or two. Uh, after Diego, uh, we're lucky enough to have Lucas Scherer from uh, Chain IQ. Chain IQ is a very innovative procurement company headquartered in Zurich. Um, I should point out that Diego's in uh, Santiago, Chile. Uh, Lucas is in, in Zurich, Switzerland. And it's a very innovative company that helps provide really good ways to outsource particular procurement functions. He'll describe more about this and how it works. Uh, we're lucky to have them here today. And actually their business is really interesting now as the uh, coronavirus uh, grows in intensity. So, so he'll, he'll describe that. Uh, then we'll go right to Q&A. So uh, uh, please, throughout the presentation, click the Q&A button, ask questions and answers, raise your hand if you want to, and we'll be sure to uh, get those questions answered as we, as we go through the agenda. So we'll work from there all the way through the end of the collaboratory. We'll make sure that we finish uh, at 10 a.m. New York time, and uh, you'll have a lot of things to do, I know, and we'll get you back, we'll keep you on schedule. So that's our, uh, that's our plan for the, for the agenda. That's our plan for how we're going to work, and uh, we'll, we'll keep that schedule. Um, here's just a few words from me to get us started. Uh, companies right now around the world are struggling to keep their supply chains alive. Uh, there's a series of things happening that make uh, continuity an essential, essential thing to consider. Uh, some of the suppliers are struggling in different industries. This is across industries. It doesn't matter if you're B2C or B2B. Many of the suppliers are struggling. And you know that having a strong supplier base is key to running a good supply chain. So some of you may be suppliers. Some of you may be uh, the, uh, the uh, customer, but either way, you're involved with this whole discussion about keeping supply chains active and working effectively across the board. Uh, it turns out that, as all of you know, that geography really matters uh, uh, to companies. And as they look at their supply chain uh, right now and where they have certain elements of production and distribution, uh, the question of geography becomes more and more important. It's not just a thing about, gee, we have too much in China. It's a thing about where should we create physical presence, where should we create virtual presence to service our customers best? And there's big, big changes going on as people rethink that uh, given this particular, uh, this pandemic. Uh, the third thing listed on that chart is demand. And uh, I will say this, that demand has always been a challenge for supply chains, really understanding the demand signals of the future. And as I mentioned earlier, it's key for supply chains, not only to respond to demand, but to create it by the way they supply the customer uh, the business, the way that they make the interaction happen. Uh, it really is possible. In fact, it's required for companies to make supply chain changes to attract and manage demand. But right now, it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult for companies to know what their demand is in the immediate future and in the longer term. So that demand question becomes a big, big issue for companies. And you have to, you have, to have some estimate where you can't move forward, uh, regardless of the business you're in. So demand, 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 very, very critical. Um, next point is about severe impacts on cash flow. Uh, many companies are having trouble recovering their costs. Uh, their labor costs, their facilities costs are high, uh, and their cash flow is actually not as strong as it should be to cover those costs. So many companies, and, and, and I think you all know this, are in fact taking costs out. Uh, labor cost reductions, closing plants, doing things, 
to reduce their capacity because quite frankly, the capacity required in the world today is less than it was even six months ago. So that's another thing that happens. Um, uh, there are companies though that have some amazing revenue increases. So uh, people who make, I'll just use one obvious one, who make hand sanitizer. Uh, there's one around the world called Purell. Uh, th they cannot make enough uh, or personal protective equipment cannot make enough. Uh, revenue increases across the board. But for how long will that be? So as a supply chain, you have to understand what your revenue is now, what's the demand now, and what will be in the future and how you can maintain that. So really, really important to understand. The equity markets have been gyrating. We saw a huge sell-off. We see now some of the markets coming back. Uh, the FTSE was up today. I think the markets in the U.S. are, are uh, trending upward. So not sure where that's going to wind up because uh, we have unemployment rates that are increasing. We have uh, stay at home orders uh, maintaining in many many countries around the world and so demand is really really difficult to uh, to understand uh, massive amounts of government assistance happening now uh, I'll just mention the US uh, the US has uh, is spending literally trillions of dollars uh, on companies to uh, help and on and people to help them work through this whole process of COVID. 19 and the coronavirus. So government assistance is part of the marketplace. It's part of how things are being done. Um, and there's huge uncertainty about when things will return to normal. What will normal be? Well, for sure we know normal is going to be much more online and your supply chain has to be much more adept at work, for example. And uh, finally, uh, this is a really important point. Uh, you have to bet about this as a company. You have to bet right or mostly right or you're not going to be successful. Uh, so understanding how you can shape your demand, how you can manage your cash flow, how you can uh, manage your supplier base, how you can keep your stock uh, price up and valuable really, really is super, uh, super important. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. I just want to make sure that everybody uh, has your, uh, has your, yourself on mute until uh, you raise your hand and we, we call on you and, uh, and go ahead and uh, get going. So I'm going to, I see there's a, Thomas Jenden, you, you've raised your hand. Can, Vivek, can you uh, uh, see what Thomas's question is? I don't, I'm. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> that was a, a user error. So. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. I thought, boy, question already. That's surprising. Okay, great. Super. Glad you, I'm glad you raised your hand. I'm glad that works. So uh, uh, raise your hand as, uh, when you have questions or, uh, as I said before, put in a Q&A. So here's what's happening in the market today. Next, next slide, please, Vivek. And um, it's just an era of unprecedented change. The coronavirus is clearly having huge impact across industries. I just picked out a few things to mention. You know, United Airlines uh, announced last week that uh, they had a 97% reduction in the airline seat requirements this year compared to last time, same last year, same time. So a 97% reduction. That is a really significant issue for any business. Uh, because of course, if you're not selling seats in an airline, you're not getting revenue. If you're not getting revenue, you can't cover your costs and, and so forth and so on. So uh, a very obvious example. Uh, multiple trillion dollar government programs across, uh, across the world. Um, interestingly enough, in the U.S., we've seen a nearly 26% gain in food and beverage store sales. Uh, most restaurants are closed, but uh, food and beverage store sales are up, up, up. Uh, and demand is uh, hard to, hard to uh, meet in some of those locations and some, so some items. Uh, global market cap in January was around 90 trillion, and uh, in February, March, we lost about six trillion of that, uh, and potentially more as uh, as we move forward. So we'll see how that goes. But clearly, this is a time where everything is moving, and it's important to stay focused on your customer and keep your supply chain uh, uh, successful. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so what are companies doing? These are things that we see happening around the world, uh, particularly in North America, but really around the world. So uh, first thing is forming a war room, uh, some team that cuts across the organization. It includes operations, supply chain, sales and marketing, finance, HR, and the focus is on the customer and on the financials. How can we make those things work? Uh, the second thing is calculating demand. Uh, this means looking at your risk profile, looking at past needs, current requirements, and what are the needs of the new customer? And increasingly people understand that something that uh, we've 
been writing on a lot in the Digital Supply Chain Institute, is that there is a new customer set of requirements. That the supply chains we've built before don't necessarily meet those requirements. So uh, what used to be considered fast delivery in the past is no longer considered fast. Um, there's a lot of things around what new customers want that we didn't even imagine could exist even five years ago. So uh, calculating demand, very important. Third thing is enabling rapid action. It's quite clear that companies are working very, very quickly to make decisions and overcoming uh, what some people call coronavirus inertia. That means people are working from home potentially, or they just feel so overwhelmed, they're not creating the same level of productivity that they used to. Um, so people are making decisions, they're overcoming inertia, uh, a real big program to reduce their costs, know the customer and predict demand. And I just put in red uh, the word financials. Managing the financials for many companies is extremely important. Knowing how to uh, cut costs, but make sure your customers are happy and make sure that you're investing in the right things for the future. Absolutely important. Uh, next is uh, a growth reassessment strategy. You know, the truth is that uh, uh, we all knew that the supply chain would, ha would change over the next five years. It was quite clear, even though the next three years dramatically changed. Uh, we knew it had to be more focused on, on uh, people and demand and so forth. Uh, and we know that to make any change happen, you have to make changes in how you manage demand, the people you have on board, the technology that you're using, uh, and the risk profile that you're that you're living through. So those four things are elements that are really, really important. And now um, we know we got to make those changes sooner rather than later. Um, big focus on financials, big focus on winter products, and in some cases, reducing the number of products that are being sold uh, in order to make uh, fulfill demand for the ones that are important. Uh, but really having a strategy moving forward for what the supply chain is going to look like, where you're going to have things located, what technology you're going to use, all going on right now, even as we try to work through this period of uh, extreme uh, uncertainty. Uh, deciding the customer, the next thing, uh, really important to get the right profile of your new customer. That doesn't mean the next customer you're going to get. It means let's look at the market today and, and decide what customers really want and set some priorities around that. And in some cases, uh, companies are going through a process of saying, here are my key customers that I must service and satisfy, and here are the ones I'm going to try to satisfy and service, but their importance is a little bit less given the long-term trajectory of our business. And finally, the growth of ideas. Uh, we have to develop grow growth ideas so that we make sure that we are the ones who are shaping the market in the future, and we're not left behind as the market changes. So those are four, uh, those are three or four very important things that we have to, uh, have to look at. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so midterm actions. Well, it turns out that we've got to do a little short-term things just to survive and be successful in the short term, whether your demand is up or down or changing. But midterm, we've got to reposition ourselves. Here are the six things that we see companies doing. Uh, one is they're really re-engineering the supply chain around this new customer idea. And they're really looking a new way to manage and make demand happen. Uh, now, there's one thing I will point out is that we've done some writing about new measures for demand. Uh, and I have to say that there are very few companies that are using demand measurement in their supply chain operation. So companies admit that, hey, yeah, the supply chain makes a big difference in demand, but they're not currently measuring as rigorously as they could be, as, as, as frankly as we think they should be. But anyway, it's happening. People are making this reengineering thing. They're going on. Uh, figure out the right people. Uh, clearly, people is an important issue, uh, and we need different kinds of people. We have to hire them, train them, and uh, make sure we have the right set of skills, particularly around data. Uh, third, a lot of new technology, uh, AI and ML, absolutely important. Uh, 3D design and manufacturing, really, really critical, particularly as we bring these closer to the customer. Logistics and delivery and all things happening there, and, and even blockchain, which is getting a little bit less press than it did before, but still could be a key element of, uh, of your solution. Number four is creating better visibility all the way through your customer base, down through your tier three suppliers and further. Fifth is uh, deciding where you can locate parts of your supply chain uh, to reduce risk and improve performance. And we want to do both those things now, so very important to do that longer term as well. And the sixth thing is, and this is actually easier now than it has been in a long time, Communicate, communicate, communicate about all of this because people need to know how important supply chain is and why change is necessary and why investments and changes and requirements are going to be uh, 
really at the front and center of managements across the world. Uh, so those are the things that are, that are super, super important. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Diego from Moralco, uh, fabulous company and amazing speaker. So uh, Diego, can I ask you to take it on from here? Okay. Hello, George. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to start this uh, presentation um, taking one or two minutes to talk a little bit about Arauco. As George said uh, a few minutes ago, we are a forest company uh, based in South America. We have industrial operations in uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, Uruguay, Mexico, the US uh, and Canada and uh, commercial uh, offices and activities uh, in about uh, 70 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. We have three main business in Morocco. We have the forest, the forest business. Uh, the purpose or the main purpose of the forest business is to supply raw material to our industrial business. Mm -hmm. The wood pulp business and the wood product business. Uh, I involve 100% uh, on the wood product business, not in the pulp business. But anyway, this presentation is going to talk a little bit about uh, everything we're doing in Arauco, not just the uh, wood product business. So uh, next slide, please. In Arauco, uh, we are thinking in um, basically a three stages for these uh, coronavirus situations. The first one is the reaction, what we have been, let's say, forced to do. The second one is the recovery stage. I mean, what are we thinking we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to do? Uh, as soon as the world is a little bit more, let's say, calm. And uh, as everybody's uh, saying now, we know that the world is going to be different. There's going to be a new normal. And uh, we're going to have to think different uh, uh, and uh, make uh, different things. Mm? So I'd like to start talking a little bit about uh, reaction and what things we have done so far. Some uh, more uh, specific things and very simple things. Uh, the first one, of course, is uh, home office. Uh, we have been uh, facing um, lockdowns, I would say, in pretty much every country where we have operations. So most of our employees has been uh, either forced by the local authorities or recommended by the company to work from home. Uh, working from home, uh, uh, it's kind of new for us, uh, even though in the administration, since we are um, in administration positions and since we're an international company, we travel a lot. But we, most of the times when we travel to go to either visit customers, visit our factories, or visit our offices. Mm -hmm. Working from home is kind of new for us, and it has proven to be a, a challenge, but uh, I have to say that a very successful one. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can talk a little bit about this uh, later. Uh, something that we have been uh, doing uh, a lot is uh, what if scenarios. Uh, information has been uh, changing a lot. Local regulations uh, in every country has been changing in terms of uh, lockdowns, um, what companies are allowed to work, what factories are allowed to work. Uh, in most of the countries, the forest activities um, have been declared essential. So I would say that at this point, we are allowed to operate all of our factories around the world. Some of them are not currently working, but because of uh, demand issues and not because of uh, government or local authorities uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. But this information is changing. We're expecting that's going to continue changing. Uh, of course, the demand is highly unpredictable now. Uh, our customers, uh, they do not know what's going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. Forecasting demand is always being a challenge, but this day has proven to be uh, a real, real uh, complex uh, thing to do. Mm -hmm. Since we are uh, producers and uh, pretty much what we sell, we produce 98% of what we are selling. Uh, if we are, if we are going to have a change in demand, we have to adjust capacity um, because we do not want to overstock. And every time we have a uh, new information about changes in demand, we have to change also the planning of our production. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the wood business products. We are running five different product lines. Uh, and in some product lines, especially uh, products that are uh, designed for furniture, the demand is very effective. But surprisingly, in some other products, uh, most related 
uh, to remodeling. Uh, the demand has keep uh, really high. And uh, in uh, two product lines, today we have more demand than what we can offer. Uh, and we have had to make a customer or re uh, redo our customer prioritization. Uh, even though every meal with a demand is working, they are not working at 100% capacity um, because we haven't been able to get all the workers working. Mm? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Mm? The company made a definition that uh, every person that is uh, in a risk group, and uh, for us to be in a risk group is people older than 60, or everybody who has a medical condition, they must remain at home. Mm? Uh, in our meals, uh, it will depend on the country, it will depend on the meal, but I could say that about uh, 10 to 15 percent of our employees are were, um, machine operators or people working in a, in a shop floor uh, are not allowed to work. Mm? So it has, uh, of course, uh, affect our ability to get uh, our products uh, done. Mm? We have also been facing a shortage of containers in some particular countries, especially Chile. So we do have some product that is already sold, waiting on the ports um, to be shipped. Mm -hmm. Also something that has, uh, that, uh, has affected uh, uh, our production is that we have implemented uh, strictly uh, safety measures in our meals. I'm gonna show you some pictures later. Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, how many people can be having uh, lunch or dinner uh, in the company's uh, facilities? I mean, how many people can be uh, in the bathroom or taking a shower uh, in the same location? Uh, how how is the, I mean, how big the distance has to be uh, in the shop floor? How many people can we have in the same bus? And uh, it has uh, also, as I said before, affected uh, our production. Hmm? For the recovery stage, and something that we have uh, work that we are working now, uh, we know that having end-to-end uh, -end supply chain visibility in real time, basing data, is going to be a must. Mm -hmm. Today we have, I mean, we have some uh, some applications, some software that helping us, but it's not really end-to-end. -end. Uh, it's not only one software. It's not only one database. Um, the situation is changing so fast that we are receiving uh, calls, I'm not going to say on a daily basis, but maybe on an hourly basis from some of our customers asking what status of the order, can they change from SKU A to SKU B, and not having all that information in the same platform form has proven to be a, a real challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of uh, what if uh, supply and demand scenarios, even though we have, a, I'm going to say, a great uh, software to run what if scenarios, those softwares are not integrated uh, in terms of uh, data gathering with our uh, um, operational systems. So it's, it, has, it takes for us, I would say, in some particular product lines, maybe a day to load all data so we can run the scenarios. And uh, it has happened that uh, when we have finished uh, loading the data, uh, the data is uh, obsolete and uh, this, the scenario has been the scenario is no longer valid. Mm -hmm. Also that we need to improve is our ability to have a more dynamic and programming in production. Um, most of our meals uh, are scheduled for production uh, once a week or twice a week. Uh, with a world that's changing so fast, that's not enough. Uh, I would say that at this point, uh, and in some particular product lines, we are needing to take definitions on a daily basis, which is something that we are not used to. And it also has been proving to be very challenging. And it also has affected our uh, productivity in some of our meals. We have been working in RPAs over the last, uh, I am, would say, uh, year, but uh, we are not where we need to be and something that we are going to have to to enhance and move uh, faster is the development of RPIs um, solutions like uh, getting orders into our systems uh, or getting work orders to our meals. This is still a highly manual activity and, um, I mean, and we need to do it better, we need to do it faster and we understand that uh, having RPAs is a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. And also something that we have been thinking a lot uh, 
is uh, we think about how many people do we have in our factories. Mm? I mean, we have been operating uh, factories for the last, I'm going to say, 60 years, and we have made some definitions about who has to be inside uh, an in-supply chain. We say that all the people working on the planning for the meal has to be at meal. All the people working on the machine programming uh, or scheduling has to be at the meal. Uh, with the coronavirus uh, situation, um, we have moved every people in administrations in the mill to do uh, home office. So today we have all the schedulers working from home, uh, most of the planners on the mills working from home. We are running like 30 mills in, uh, in America, so that's a bunch of people. Uh, and it has worked great. Mm? So we say, okay, I mean, it has a cost to move people from their uh, houses to the mills, especially in South America, where the company has to provide uh, transportation. Uh, for most of our people, it's taking us uh, up to, I'm gonna say two to three hours a day to move from their houses to the mills. And uh, if they can uh, work at home, it's gonna be great for them. It's gonna be great for the company because we are not gonna have to pay for uh, transportation. We're not gonna have to pay for uh, lunch or dinner. Um, our insurance probably is going to go down because we have uh, less people in the mills. Um, I think that also we're going to need uh, less people if we can have all the supply, maybe not all, but a big portion of the supply chain people working in a central office um, and not at the mill. So that, of course, is something that uh, we are going to have to think about it. In order to do that, we're going to have to have a, a better visibility than the one that we have now. We are going to have to have, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, drones uh, in our meals. And so the planners of the schedulers are going to be able to take a look on the inventory because it's not uh, always, uh, with the information in the system, it's not always 100% uh, accurate. And sometimes you have to go to the shop floor uh, or to the warehouse to actually check if uh, a unit is at the warehouse and so on. Mm? And for the new normal, uh, I think that we are thinking, or I'm going to say dreaming now, because to be honest, we haven't had too much time to think about the new normal, but thinking about uh, uh, operational uh, data, I mean, having 100% of uh, our equipment sensorized so we can have online information about what's going on in all of our factories. Um, we have made some, uh, we have been working about uh, uh, analytic tools to support machine operators, but there's much things that we can do about it. Um, we also think that by using uh, machine learning and analytics, we can do some optimization of our processes, maybe even in the design processes. And also something that uh, we have been thinking about is augmented reality for uh, remote monitoring and maintenance. So maybe we are not gonna need to have so many staff of maintenance people at mail. Hmm? Uh, next slide, please. Well, and Diego, you. if you could, uh, if you could uh, uh, work to wrap this up, so we make sure the other speakers get some time as well. Thank you. Okay. What I'm showing here is just uh, a couple of screenshots of our what if scenarios. I mean, that's basically tools that we've had uh, developed uh, in house, so to speak. And uh, when we have all the information lo uh, load in the system. I mean, we can run many different scenarios. We can get an estimation on how our cost is going to be affected. I mean, how much product are we going to be able to produce? What percentage of each SKU uh, are we going to be able to get? Uh, how long it's going to take to get them produced? So uh, they have been proven to be a really, really useful uh, tools for this period of time. But again, uh, one weakness that we have now is uh, it's taking us uh, a, lot um, a lot of time to get all the data in these uh, tools, basically all the operational data. Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. Here, what I'm showing you is just uh, what, uh, this is in Spanish, sorry, but uh, to show how are we handling uh, uh, our uh, home office work. Um, Sebastián Fernández, who is our VP for uh, digital transformation, um, is in the presentation. And if possible, uh, I would like to Sebastian to talk uh, one or two minutes about this. Um, Sebastian, are you in? Yes, I mean, thanks, Diego. Just very briefly to, to comment on the fact that last year we were 
already incorporating uh, agility as a, as a methodology for, for working in, in several of our, of our teams. And what you're looking at here is basically the, some, some tools uh, that all of you who, who have been uh, working with this methodology uh, might be aware of uh, that, that help. And, and we've, we've seen how successfully teams have been able to manage home office and still being in, in contact, still being uh, very clear in terms of what the objectives are, how uh, their daily, weekly, uh, or monthly work uh, is, is being planned and how uh, they, despite the fact that uh, are not face-to-face uh, -face and are not sitting within the same uh, meeting room or, or work room, uh, are still uh, able to be efficient uh, and productive about their work because of the fact that uh, this, uh, these tools uh, that are available uh, that uh, we've been using, uh, dashboards and, and uh, Kanban uh, boards and, and things like that, uh, have allowed them to, uh, to still be on track, uh, still knowing what everyone's doing at, the, at every moment during the week or day. And uh, to, to our surprise, we were concerned, of course, that this, uh, this wouldn't uh, work the way we, we were used to, uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, even the agile teams, uh, we, we were used to, to seeing them uh, pasting post-its uh, in a wall all together in, in the same room. Well, uh, technology has, has proven us uh, wrong and uh, we know now that uh, home office is, uh, uh, except for a period of adjustment, of course, at the beginning, but now it's, uh, it's not an issue. All right, great. Hey, thank you, Sebastian. I appreciate uh those ideas. I want to make sure we leave enough time for our other uh, other company yeah. to present. Yes, uh, sorry, <laughs> give me just one minute to finish with this. Uh, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, and I would like to show you these pictures because um, I mean, keeping the operation running uh, is not just about digitalization. It's not just about technology. It's not just about the business definitions, but it's also about people. It's also about to keep the people working to make them feel that they are safe in our facilities, uh, to let them, uh, all of our workers know that they are, they are not gonna be in danger if they are working in our facilities. And that's most of the times based on a really simple definitions like uh, cleaning the equipment. We have been providing uh, materials, of course, and instruction to all of our workers on how to clean their equipment after their work. In all of our meals, we have a draw, as you can say in the picture, lines in the floor, so people know I mean, how to keep distance between each other. Uh, I'm showing uh, the, also a picture of uh, our um, uh, dining rooms uh, in the meals. I mean, we, at the beginning, we say, okay, there's, there, we are, they're not allowed to be more than uh, two per table, but they start uh, sitting together. So we have to put crosses on the table so they just can sit uh -huh. where the cross is. Okay. And uh, that's especially for a production-based company uh, like Arauco, uh, giving the sense of safety to the people is, uh, is uh, absolutely necessary to keep the operation running. Hmm? So, well, that's for my side, uh, George. Great. Hey, thank you. Thank you both for a great presentation on Arauco. It's an exciting company. You're doing, you're doing great things. I want to Turn it over now to uh, Chain IQ. There's two speakers from Chain IQ. Uh, Lucas is the Chief Operating Officer, and Richard Picaro, who uh, we didn't have on our introductory slide, he, he is a key member uh, of the team in North America. So uh, can I turn it over to you, Lucas and Richard? Sure, thank you very much, George. Um, then let's just jump on the next slide. In fact, what we have so far prepared is about, you know, that we are just quickly giving you a perspective and understanding about what Chain IQ is doing. Because I truly believe, you know, it's important that you can then also put a little bit our experience into a context. And then certainly we have prepared about a two pager, where especially Rich and myself would like to give you an, an insight, in fact, what we are doing together with our clients, and especially this uh, current situation with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so just very quickly about Chain IQ. Uh, Chain IQ, in, in, in fact, what we are, we are one of the global leading independent indirect procurement service providers. What does it exactly mean? It means that we offer global procurement services to our, to our clients, whereas we, we roughly have uh, roughly 50 clients in our portfolio. 
And uh, the very nice thing is about we are operating out of six main centers, whereas we have additionally 11 offices worldwide. We are roughly managing a spend of roughly 12 billion. Um, why I'm saying that? Because for me, it's important that everybody understands in the call that we are not just an advisor. We are not just about a consultant, meaning about we indeed are managing a spend of roughly 12 billion and especially very much focused on indirect spend especially focusing on global clients, which have definitely footprint around the globe. What does it mean? It means that we have roughly about 300 sourcing and the procurement specialists around the world. And we strongly believe that this is, by the way, one of our unique selling propositions that we have these 20 locations around the globe, where we can definitely also leverage on our shared service centers in uh, Romania and India. But for us, it's absolutely essential that we are very close to our clients helping them locally to understand better what's going on and finally being capable, obviously, also to discuss with them about strategic changes if strategic changes in the supply chains are necessary. Um, while I'm looking at that one, also that you must probably understand it, it's about what we as Chain IQ stands for is very much about on two pillars. The one is about that we are very much a digitalized company. I mean, we, we definitely drive digitalization procurement very actively forward. We're talking about platforms, RPA, uh, data. We're talking about artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas on the other side, we strongly believe that, you know, as it comes to more strategic use, strategic collaboration, strategic re-evaluation of supply chains for that we have locally and regionally our strategic sourcing experts helping the clients definitely to go through about all the different aspects in procurement. Now, when I'm just quickly reviewing about, you know, what is currently our status? Um, our status today in, in the COVID-19 situation, in fact, we are generally very, very happy because we were able to switch to 100% home office within one day. And this was mainly being given because of our digital platforms, digital setup. It means, in fact, purely from a chain IQ perspective, we had not even one day of, of business interruptions because we were just being capable to drive it forward. Additionally, what we see is about that purely from a client side, and, and believe me, you know, we tried to forecast, we tried even about somehow to uh, simulate about the demand in the future. And to be honest, we, we just have given up to do whatever simulation based on, on whatever models. Uh, because currently the situation is so changing fast that what we are doing is about we are very close to our clients and especially from our strategic sourcing expertise together with strategic sourcing from the client and based in this very close collaboration we are reviewing in fact even daily about what's going on which demand is coming in and uh, much probably interestingly but not really a big surprise, much probably for the majority of the people also in the call, is about what we see, that there is a massive additional demand related to, to IT services. So it means we are currently sourcing massively more IT software, IT hardware. We definitely are being very much engaged to enable all our clients to definitely get more and quickly uh, to a digital framework. Uh, additionally, what we are seeing is there is a very strong need from our clients to start now to having more strategic discussions with us about how to redesign, how to reprioritize, how to de-risk the whole supply chains. Uh, and I'm not saying even about regionally, but, but even globally, um, because we definitely see that now the clients, they do start to think about what's going off to COVID-19 especially because we definitely see, especially in Europe, certain uh, light at the end of the tunnel, meaning about the governments are also now restarting uh, to definitely change about the lockdown situation in different client, uh, countries. So that means, when I'm just quickly wrapping up from my perspective, um, we are so far, I believe, in, in a good situation because we are very much digitalized driven. Uh, what we see is about we cannot really forecast and predict the forecast, it means uh, the demand, it means we have to be very close, especially about our clients, uh, to even uh, understand about on a daily basis what's going on. Third but not least, we see a, a strong need to further focus on, on strategic sourcing and the category management to much better understand, in fact, what's truly going on 
in the supply chains today but also in the future. What I now would like to do is about to introduce uh, quickly about uh, Richard because Richard is our head of delivery in the US and he definitely can also give you a very good insight from the front what also Richard did uh, together with our clients because I truly believe that we are doing in the special Richard there is doing an exceptional job. Richard? Yes, Lucas, thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you uh, great. Thank you, George. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, Lucas, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, just a little bit of context. I mean, obviously, as Lucas mentioned, you know, Chain IQ focuses on indirect procurement. We're not, we're non-production. So really the focus of what we deliver and how we advise our clients is really around commercial points and corporate function points. And so I think stepping back a second before we hit the content of the slide is I think the one thing that's clear about COVID is that everyone was wrong. Uh, whether it be the healthcare professionals, whether it be the governments. And, and I think what's very obvious is we're in a state of, of incredible uncertainty. And that's obviously been reflected in business overall, supply chain, so on and so forth. And I think, you know, just a, a, a personal thought, you know, the obviously the importance of digitalization is has gone up 100 fold and, uh, and hence the importance of this organization. Uh, uh, DSCI is, is also gone up 100 fold within the span of you know six eight weeks. So so I think the one thing that's emerging here in the U.S. for sure is you know the the possibility that we may never go back to our former ways of working you know entirely. So so digital supply chain, chain digitization the way we work um, I, I think we're all in for for quite a big um, paradigm shift a plate tectonic frankly. In terms of our organization, as Lucas said, you know, we switched to a digital delivery model very quickly. And, and I think right now, if, if you were to ask me, hey, you know, what's the, what's your concern that's keeping you up at night? It's actually the, the, the opposite of something George mentioned earlier, where our concern is not around the productivity of our staff globally. Our concern is around burnout because, you know, I think what we're seeing is, Incredible engagement uh, uh, with, with our with our uh, employee base, and we're seeing people, you know, having a very difficult time, myself included, frankly, being able to separate their personal and professional lives, and uh, and maybe spending a little too much time uh, uh, in the work mode. So burnout is is one of our top concerns. So to get to the slide content very quickly here, so. The content that, that is showing on your screen is actually over six weeks old. So what we initially wanted to do for our clients is give them some very tactical, very actionable tasks immediately as soon as the COVID situation unfolded. Um, we knew we didn't have time for a webinar or a white paper or anything like that. We wanted to get as tactical as possible with feedback directly from our frontline sourcers and buyers. Put that into, into this bulletin, which I'll sort of walk you through in a moment. But where we're really at now is we're moving from the, these initial tactical bits um, to develop a separate set of recommendations and strategies for that matter, because what we're seeing with, across our client base is they're through the initial shock and, and they're almost moving into a recession-like or de even depression-like mentality, you know, questioning, okay, what is my business going to look like going forward, you know, beyond COVID or, or, or you know, COVID uh, elongates disruption, you know, what's that look like? So it's a much more systemic discussion now than a survival discussion than it was uh, six weeks ago or so. So to run through the slides, and I will not go through every bullet because there's a lot of content there and it doesn't make for a fun presentation. Um, feel free to employ or use any of this yourselves if you like, but just a couple of points. So the first bit was we, we told our clients that you really have to go back and look at the BCP, BCP plans, the continuity plans of your suppliers. Obviously, we're all executing our own BCPs, but, you know, it's not going to help if a, a source of supply, you know, good or service, you know, into a critical process um, is, uh, is failing on you. And we found some interesting things. I'll give you one anecdote, you know, on the services side, outsourced services side. What we found was there were a tremendous number of outsourced services providers whose BCP plans entailed moving from facility A to facility B. Very few of them had a BCP plan that said move from facility A to virtual home office. And many of them, at least in the initial days, had absolutely no remote work possibility whatsoever. 
because if you think about it, they didn't have laptops. Um, they, they were they were wired in, you know, from a, a security perspective, you know, to a physical physical terminal, so and so forth. So that was a challenge. Uh, again, one example, but it underscores a, a, a good reason as to why you know your suppliers BCPs really need to be scrutinized quickly. But moving along, you know, obviously uh, technology, as I mentioned earlier, be becoming more paramount than ever. Um, I'll give you an example that I never thought that I, I, I would have. Um, experienced in, in, in my professional lives. Um, shortages on laptops and other thin client related supply. Absolutely stunning to us in, in, the, early, in the early days of this. Um, in terms of uh, uh, other things that we looked at, you know, uh, human capital obviously scaling up and scaling down. So understanding employee onboarding, offboarding, how do you do a fingerprint? How do you do a badge? If you, if you need an employee ID, how do you get access to systems and platforms if, if some of the onboarding and offboarding or onboarding in that case is physical? You know, something to talk about. In terms, in terms of the next section, uh, contractual rights, flexibility, you know, this is where you have to understand your positions, but also be very careful. So understanding force majeure, under, looking at contracts that you could suspend or cancel, um, things you need to understand, but also bear in mind that if you action them, it can have long-term consequences with your supply base. Um, I have a similar thought for you on, um, on employees um, later on. But uh, it, also in terms of, of benefits, having a look at your benefits contracts. And, and we, what we found is, look, com most companies were not really pushing a lot of the benefits that they were paying for and their employees were paying for, for the self-funded plans telemedicine, mental health insurances, or mental health um, services, different types of insurances, COVID-specific services, again, worth a look. You're paying for it, and, uh, and you really reap the benefit of it. Uh, can we go to the next slide, and then I'll wrap up? So the last slide, again, a long section. I'm just going to hit you with a couple of highlights. Um, you know, look, looking at your policies. Why would you look at your policy? Not exactly the most interesting thing you can do in supply chain. However, very important to ensure that the controls that we put in before COVID are not crushing your business. You know, changing rules are in, in systems uh, uh, that facilitate purchasing, looking at new purchasing vehicles. Maybe you didn't use virtual cards before. Maybe you want to repurpose your expense mechanisms uh, to, to get cr critical items to your people. Again, worth a look and just want to make sure that you don't constrain yourself based on controls that were relevant pre-COVID. And within processing, I, th I think this, this speaks for itself. I mean, clearly, um, you know, if you were a firm and you were set up for 10% of your workforce to be, to, be, to be virtual, and now you're at 100, clearly you want to sit down and understand, you know, what increased bandwidth, what, what, you know, what's required from a supply side perspective. I think that's obvious. Physical documents, critical. Statutory HR documents, contracts. Um, uh, hardware delivery, as I mentioned earlier to your staff, you know, laptops, monitors, things of that ilk. Um, did you have a control that said that you couldn't ship that stuff to uh, home offices? Don't know. Worth a look. Very important. Repairs? Uh, don't bother. Um, uh, really, exchanges are what it's all about in a crisis. Um, uh, the physical piece and the, and, the, and the cycles are associated with repair. Um, if you can avoid them, do it. Last bit. Um, now's the time. All of us, I'm sure, have uh, significant, significant uh, experience with your Arivas, your Coupas, your trade shifts, you name it. Um, if you have the technology, exploit it now because now's the time. So that's all I have, George. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, thank you. Thank you both. Can IQ is a very interesting company. They're doing great, great work. And I, I really appreciate uh, your sharing your ideas here. Um, let me just uh, find out where we've, I've gone through and tried to answer your, some of your Q&As as, you, as you've asked them. I'll go through and get more of those after the call is over. Is there anyone here who uh, would like to offer any thoughts on these topics um, um, as, we, as we go through, uh, as we wrap up the session? We're, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So anybody want to offer any thoughts or ideas or questions for the panelists? George, let me uh, hop in here for a second. Uh, Mark Baum, are you uh, able to share a perspective from the food industry, uh, given your membership? Uh, or Doug uh, Baker, are you able to just give us a perspective on another sector 
and the impact that what you've heard from uh, Diego and from uh, Lucas and uh, and Richard, how it might compare with with what you're doing in the food sector. So uh, yeah, hi, Mark. I'm, I don't know if Doug is on. Doug, are you on the line? <clears throat> he may not be. Uh, yeah. So we're one of those uh, frontline industries whereby um, we've had to uh, test our supply chain in in ways almost unimaginable before all of this. Um, and what we've learned uh, without having a lot of time to go into detail here is just how flexible and agile and expandable the supply chain can be when put to the test. Um, we've had to, in some cases, just given the exponential increase in demand, uh, had to rationalize certain SKUs um, to expand capacity for those items that were most in demand, um, and in many cases, uh, we had to repurpose. So because of the huge increase in demand at retail with a corresponding drop-off in demand in away from home food service and related outlets, uh, it wasn't a shortage of supply per se. It was really about getting inventory to where it needed to be. And that's uh, both you know geographically to stores to, in some cases, the uh, local food banks and other agencies that were taking care of a lot of people that were uh, laid off or furloughed as a result of this. We are still seeing some spot shortages in some categories. Somebody mentioned sanitizer. I think it was you, George, at the top of the call. Um, that is still the case, but we are starting to see consumption uh, pick up and sort of level out with demand. Of course, as several of the other speakers mentioned, we have no idea what the what the back end of this will look like and if we have another outbreak in the fall what the impact will be uh, during a second wave one thing and this might merit uh, some conversation for a future uh, collaboratory which is what this looks like on our business and operating model on the back end what this impact what how this impacts r d and innovation or sku rationalization or assortment at store level uh, we've certainly seen a reduction in SKUs and a reconfiguration of assortment, both in center store and around the perimeter. And we will see more of that going forward. Uh, one could actually argue we probably should have been in this exercise 10 or 12 years ago, and this has forced the reckoning of that. And of course, um, we'll see how this affects line extensions vis-a-vis -vis real innovation going forward. Um, there are there's been um, an unprecedented level of collaboration between um, upstream players between agriculture and and food processors and manufacturers and then downstream between wholesalers and distributors and the self distributing retail chains as well uh, in order to a uh, understand where shortages might occur to also communicate to consumers and other stakeholders uh, the media, financial markets, and the like, just what kind of an impact this is having. We're monitoring takeaway at the uh, point of sale on a week-by-week -week basis. We're still seeing some truly incredible spikes in some categories, up into triple digits. Um, and in some cases, we're uh, seeing a leveling off, and uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. And by the way, that's just in the U.S. We're also looking at this globally. And um, I apologize because I know we're out of time. Um, but hopefully that gives you some idea of, of what's been happening here. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Thank you. Over to you, George. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Mark, thank you. That was great. Good to hear how that's working in, in your industry. And uh, we're at the top of the hour, so I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, we're going to be doing another one of these on May 7th. We'll have different uh, companies involved. We'll have different geographies again. We'd like to look at the worldview. And uh, we hope you can all join us again. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody stay healthy. Bye for now. Thank you very much.